Our next trip's itinerary would be quite focused and straightforward. We would spend September 2nd through the 5th, 1993, in Dallas, searching for any information that could be found relating to Malcolm Wallace. We also made arrangements to meet with Madeline Brown for a recorded interview. I flew into Dallas from Los Angeles and Mark from St. Louis. Upon meeting and renting a car, we went to the JFK Assassination Information Center to meet with Larry Howard and to bring him up to date with the information we had developed on Wallace so far. He suggested the Dallas Public Library as an excellent place to find what we were looking for, and as it turned out, the library was just a short distance from our hotel. Early the next morning, we made our way to the seventh floor of the library, where archives of the Dallas Morning News, as well as other reference materials, are located. It didn't take us long to realize we had hit pay dirt. Our goal was to find two things, photographs of Malcolm Wallace and information relating to his life, education, and his background. For nearly two days, we uncovered all of that and more. First and foremost, we retrieved a front-page article from the Dallas Morning News dated Friday, March 23, 1984. It was concerning the murder of Henry Marshall, which Madeline had earlier briefed us on. The headline read, Billy Saul links LBJ to murder. There were four photographs, Billy Saul Estes, LBJ, Henry Marshall, and there was Malcolm Wallace. We studied the photograph of Wallace carefully, as this was the first view of our subject. He looked handsome, perhaps even studious, dressed in a suit and tie with wire-rimmed glasses. Now we had something we could show Loy, a photograph of Wallace. We read on, by David Hanners, staff writer of the News, Franklin, Texas. Convicted swindler Billy Saul Estes told a grand jury that Lyndon B. Johnson was one of four men who planned the 1961 murder of an agriculture official, three sources close to the grand jury said Thursday. The sources said Estes testified that the group feared the official would link Estes' illegal activities to Johnson. Estes, who was given immunity from prosecution to testify before a Robertson County grand jury Tuesday, told grand jurors that Johnson felt pressure to silence Henry Harvey Marshall of Bryan, a regional U.S. Department of Agriculture official in charge of the federal cotton allotment program, sources said. Lady Bird Johnson, the president's widow, could not be reached for comment on Estes' testimony Thursday. All we will say is that Mrs. Johnson does not answer scurrilous attacks and comments such as that, said Liz Carpenter, who served as Mrs. Johnson's press secretary when LBJ was president. The sources, who asked to remain anonymous because grand jury testimony is secret under state law, said Estes testified that he had attended at least three meetings with Johnson, two in Washington and one at the Driscoll Hotel in Austin, during which they discussed the need to stop Marshall from disclosing Estes' fraudulent business dealings and his ties with Johnson. Estes testified that he later balked at the idea of killing Marshall, according to sources. Marshall had resisted attempts to transfer him from Bryan to Agriculture Department headquarters in Washington in order to silence him. Sources said Estes' testimony implicated Johnson, who had just been elected vice president. Estes and his family have repeatedly said that Estes was a political ally of LBJ and that Estes made repeated campaign contribution to LBJ's campaigns. Johnson assumed the presidency on the death of John F. Kennedy on November 22, 1963. He was elected in 1964 to a full term, but chose in 1968 not to seek re-election. He died at his ranch in Stonewall, Texas on January 22, 1973. Second person mentioned in the article was Clifton C. Carter, a close Johnson political aide and troubleshooter who later served as executive director and treasurer of the Democratic National Committee. Carter died of natural causes in Arlington, Virginia Hospital 
September 21, 1971. Third person mentioned in the article was Malcolm Everett Mack Wallace, the president of the 1945 student body at the University of Texas in Austin and a one-time U.S. Agriculture Department economist. Wallace, whom sources said Estes identified as Marshall's killer, previously had avoided a prison term on a 1952 murder conviction in Austin. Wallace died, sources said, in a northeast Texas automobile accident in 1971. A relative found Marshall's body June 3, 1961, on his Robertson County ranch. He had been shot five times, and his bolt-action 22 caliber rifle was found nearby. His death originally was ruled a suicide by a local justice of the peace, but the ruling came into question a year later when news broke of Marshall's investigation of Estes' cot allotments. U.S. Marshal Clint Peoples, who as a Texas Ranger captain began investigating the murder in 1962, said Thursday that Marshall was blowing the whistle on Estes' scheme to defraud the government's cotton allotment program. Peoples, who persuaded Estes to testify before the grand jury Tuesday, refused to name the people whom Estes implicated in the conspiracy. I asked him, that is Estes, why he didn't testify at the first grand jury in 1962, and he said if he had, he would have been a dead man, said John Paschal, the district attorney. Paschal said records from the 1962 grand jury revealed that Marshall approved 138 cot allotments for Estes from January 17th to June 3, 1961. But people said the facts are that Henry Marshall was told to approve them, that is, the cotton allotments. Before 1961, Estes, a Pecos millionaire who had made much of his money through federally subsidized farm programs, had become a key Democratic power broker and fundraiser for the campaigns of Johnson, Yarborough, and then Governor John Connolly. Less than a year later, Estes' multi-million dollar empire, built on non-existent grain storage elevators and cotton allotments he obtained fraudulently, collapsed. In March 1962, Estes was indicted on fraud charges. Two months later, U.S. Agriculture Secretary Orville Freeman said Marshall had been the only man who could provide some of the answers to questions about Estes' involvement in the cotton allotment program. Days later, a state district judge in Bryan authorized the exhumation of Marshall's body. An autopsy by Harris County Medical Examiner Joseph Jakimczyk revealed that Marshall suffered not only five gunshot wounds to his lower left abdomen, but also carbon monoxide poisoning and a head injury. The bruise to Marshall's head occurred before his death, Jakimczyk said, and would have been incapacitating. Sybil Marshall, the wife of the slain agriculture department official, said Thursday, I'm kind of shocked. I don't know what to think. Mrs. Marshall said her family always believed her husband had been murdered. I can't believe he would do that to himself, that is, commit suicide, she said. He was a good man. Estes, despite two federal trials and subsequent prison terms in the following two decades, steadfastly had refused to discuss his relationship with Lyndon Johnson or the Marshall murder. Called to testify before a 1962 grand jury investigating Marshall's death, Estes repeatedly invoked his constitutional right against self-incrimination, according to the press reports at the time. According to Estes' daughter, Pam Estes, who wrote in a book about her father entitled Billy Saul, which was released last week, Daddy's silence allowed Lyndon Johnson to become president. During that time, Daddy had been supplying Lyndon Johnson with large infusions of cash, not only for his own political needs, but for people Johnson himself chose to help. Sometimes Johnson would send people like Ralph Yarborough directly to Daddy for fundraising help. On other occasions, Johnson would get bundles of cash from Daddy and distribute it to himself. Since those transactions were all cash, there is no reliable way of knowing how much money went to Johnson or what became of it. 
Daddy had steadfastly refused to talk about that part of his life with anyone, even me, she wrote. Wallace, whom sources said Estes named as the trigger man in Marshall's murder, at one time had dated Johnson's sister, Josepha, according to a friend of the Johnson family who asked not to be identified. Johnson's sister died in 1961. However, Horace Busby, a close friend of Johnson's, said Johnson met Wallace only once, when Carter brought Wallace to Johnson's home in Washington. Wallace was convicted in 1952 of killing John Douglas Kinzer of Austin. Testimony in that case revealed that Kinzer had been having an affair with Wallace's wife. Wallace was sentenced to a five-year prison term, which was suspended. Wallace was represented in his 1952 trial by Austin criminal defense lawyer John Kofer, now deceased. Kofer, a longtime LBJ confidant, had represented Johnson in the Jim Wells County Box 13 voter fraud case in 1948. Because of the slim edge of 87 votes he received from Box 13, Johnson won a runoff election against Coke Stevenson for the U.S. Senate. Lyndon Johnson's personal attorney, John Kofer, defended Estes in his 1962 fraud trial. Ms. Estes said in her book that Kofer was hired at the insistence of Lyndon Johnson. He rested Estes' case without calling any defense witnesses, and she goes on to say that I feel that this was done to make sure that there was no opportunity of implicating Lyndon Johnson during any testimony or cross-examination. It should be clear by now that it was Lyndon Johnson who paved the way for the preferential treatment my father received from the Agricultural Department. Estes, who was in Dallas Tuesday to autograph copies of his daughter's book, refused to comment on his appearance before the grand jury Tuesday. Peoples said Thursday that Estes finally had agreed to testify after he arranged for Estes' immunity from prosecution. The marshal also said that Estes wanted to clear his conscience about Marshall's death, and he should be commended for it. Peoples, who escorted Estes to Latuna Federal Correctional Institute in El Paso in 1979, after Estes' second fraud conviction, said he had told Estes, Billy Saul, you ought to straighten this thing out. I'm not saying you did it, but I'm saying you know who did. People said Estes told him then, You're looking in the wrong direction. You ought to be looking for the people with the most to lose. Estes drove to Waco to People's home Monday night and met with him to discuss his testimony and his immunity. This is the first time that Billy Saul has ever testified against anybody, Peoples said. Although he repeatedly declined to discuss the grand jury investigation, Peoples said Estes had brought out evidence that I had in my files that he couldn't have known except one way. The Agriculture Department, in an attempt to reduce the surplus of cotton in the early 1960s, strictly controlled the acreage to be planted in the crop embargoing cotton production on new land. Estes, however, devised a scheme under which cotton allotments or federal permits to grow the crop were transferred from other farmers to his Pecos farm. Meanwhile, the agriculture department was in a dither, Pam Estes wrote in her book. They didn't know whether my father was legally leasing the land with cotton allotments attached or illegally purchasing allotments. In the summer of 1961, they decided to conduct an investigation to try to satisfy themselves as to its legality. By the fall of 1961, my father had gotten word of the investigation. His first reaction was to go to Washington and knock some heads together. This was something my father knew how to do very well, she wrote. This is starting to fill in, I commented to Mark. Not bad for the first hour, he said, smiling. Madeline had informed us that the Wallace she knew was a killer who was covertly working for Lyndon Johnson. 
Now, another witness, albeit a known con man, testifies under oath to a grand jury that Malcolm was the killer of Henry Marshall at the behest of LBJ. The obvious picture to develop from this information was that Wallace not only extricated Vice President Johnson from political ruin, but also expedited his promotion to the presidency by planning and carrying out the assassination of President Kennedy. But while Wallace was loyally ministering to the needs of Johnson, Billy Saul Estes was busily ingratiating himself to Johnson by funneling millions of dollars to an LBJ slush fund, according to another report. From a news report from the Dallas Morning News dated Saturday, March 24, 1984, by David Hanners, from Franklin, Texas, it says, Convicted swindler, Billy Saul Estes, told a grand jury that illegal cotton allotments and other business deals he arranged with Lyndon B. Johnson's help in the early 1960s generated $21 million a year, with part of the money going to a slush fund controlled by LBJ, sources close to the grand jury said Friday. Estes, protected from prosecution by a grant of immunity, testified for four and a half hours Tuesday before the Robertson County Grand Jury. The sources said Estes testified that in January 1961, the same month LBJ became vice president, Estes and two other men met with Johnson at LBJ's Washington home to discuss Henry Harvey Marshall of Bryan, an agriculture department official, who was questioning the legality of Estes' cotton allotments. Estes quoted LBJ as saying, Get rid of him, referring to Marshall, the sources said. Estes, the sources said, told grand jurors that four men were involved in planning the murder of Marshall. Estes, Johnson troubleshooter and close aide Clifton C. Carter, trigger man Malcolm Everett, Mac Wallace, and Johnson himself. Estes is the only one of the four still alive. The sources said Estes testified that he and Carter met at Estes' home in Pecos after Marshall's death, and that Carter commented that Wallace sure did botch it up. The sources said Estes testified that Wallace planned to kill Marshall and make it look as if the death were suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning. According to the sources, Estes testified that Wallace hit Marshall on the head and then placed a plastic bag over Marshall's head and the exhaust pipe of Marshall's pickup truck. About that time, the sources quoted Estes as saying, Wallace heard a noise that sounded like an approaching car, and fearing that he was about to be discovered, Wallace shot Marshall in the abdomen five times with the twenty two caliber rifle and left the scene, the sources quoted Estes as saying. In the next two years, three other men with ties to Estes, George Crudelec, a Texas accountant from Clint, Texas, Amarillo businessman Harold Eugene Orr and Chicago fertilizer supplier Howard Pratt were found with indications that they had died of carbon monoxide poisoning, according to press reports at the time. The source close to the Robertson County Grand Jury said that the uh, Estes refused to answer questions about the four deaths in West Texas, telling District Attorney John Paschal that he wasn't going to testify about anything that would put him in the penitentiary. Paschal would not discuss the deaths Estes was asked about. Sources close to the grand jurors said they considered part of Estes' testimony to be truthful, but believed he was shading his story to put himself in a better light. Now, speaking of these suicides, we found an article entitled Last One Standing in the Houston Chronicle, dated June 23, 1996, by Evan Moore. And there, he reports there was some irregularities in the death of George Crudelec. Earlier, just four days after Estes was arrested, George Crudelec, 49, an El Paso accountant for the farmers who 
signed the ammonia tank mortgages, had been found dead in his car near El Paso a week before he was scheduled to give a deposition in the Estes case. A hose was attached to the exhaust and run through a rear window. But former El Paso County Sheriff's Captain Freddy Bonilla says there was something strange about Crittleck's body. The man was propped awkwardly behind the wheel, stiff as a board and straight as an arrow. He'd obviously been dead long enough for rigor mortis to set in before he was shoved behind the wheel of that car. Bonilla reopened the Crudelec case in 1984, but found only skimpy reports and no evidence. No carbon monoxide was found in Crudelec's lungs. The cause of death was listed as cardiac arrest. And the matter ruled suicide, a ruling Bonilla believes was obviously wrong. One cannot wonder, after reading these reported testimonies, if Wallace was also responsible for the carbon monoxide deaths of others related to the Estes Johnson affair. Clint Peoples himself remarked that the deaths of Krudelek, Orr, and Pratt seemed too similar to be coincidence. They were all carbon monoxide poisonings. In examining the newspaper accounts of the 1962 grand jury investigation into the mysterious death of Henry Marshall, we found that the people of Texas were not the only ones following this bizarre case. In an article concerning the 1962 investigation written January 6, 1985, David Hanner relates in the Dallas Morning News, Among those watching the grand jury proceedings was Barefoot Sanders, then U.S. District Attorney in Dallas, and now a federal judge. Former Texas Attorney General Will Wilson and Sanders, who had declined repeated requests for interviews on the Estes case, was in constant communication with Justice Department officials, particularly with Robert Kennedy, the U.S. Attorney General. Wilson said he believed Kennedy, who Wilson said had an intense dislike for Johnson, had sent Sanders to monitor the grand jury to see if the vice president's name arose. Other sources seem to agree with this scenario. It was generally known by many that there was a political rift between Johnson and Robert Kennedy. Hanners, in another article related to the 1962 events, dated April 4, 1984, says, In his appearance before the grand jury last month, Estes testified that Robert Kennedy may have offered Marshall protection if he would testify against Johnson, sources said. Sources close to the grand jury said Estes testified that Johnson, while Senate Majority Leader, controlled a political slush fund raised from some of Estes' illegal business dealings. He, that is Sanders, made several times daily telephone reports to Robert Kennedy as to what was happening. Wilson said, we were aware of the tremendous emotional and personal rivalry between Robert Kennedy and LBJ. The Kennedys closely observed the proceedings and then followed them by the hour. Wilson said he believes Estes is telling the truth about the plot. We were fortunate to find a copy of Clint Peoples' Texas Ranger at the library. In it, we quickly found an account describing his investigation of the Marshall murder. We were impressed with his explanation of the facts surrounding the case. Surely we could see that this had been a murder, a botched murder perhaps, but a murder nonetheless. This is the end of the first half of chapter 11. The second half will soon follow in a separate video. And I'd like to thank everyone for watching. Please give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. And please, by all means, subscribe.